What is up, everybody? Mark on the mic here. We have Lee and Drew from Seek One here. They are paying us a visit. We are really enjoying our time together. If you're not familiar with these guys, which you probably are, but I'll say this anyway, they are from Seek One. These guys are absolutely crushing YouTube, crushing YouTube. And part of their crushing YouTube strategy is you guys are crushing huge bucks on the regular. We try. That's the goal, yeah. Yeah. We try. That's the sound of humble right there, <laughs> by the way, everybody. So we're going to dive into their heads a little bit today. This is a 10-minute talk-ish, like we always say. We throw, we throw a big ish in there. We're going to get into some of their, their tactics, specifically your mobile setup. You guys are hopping around a lot. You got to be mobile. Uh, what We've got some of your mobile set. If yep. you're watching on YouTube, you can see that here today. But yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about what you, go, what you have going on with, with your mobile setup and, and how you guys are setting up. Yeah, so first of all, it's super important to be mobile when you're hunting suburbs, particularly like really small blocks of woods. A uh, couple of reasons. One, a lot of the properties that we hunt are between sometimes as small as a half acre up to five acres is kind of like the typical range. And a lot of times you don't have a bunch of trees to choose from. So A, you're, try you're picking trees that aren't ideal. They may be curved, they may be really small. So having a, a stand or a saddle that you can actually hang in those trees is really important. But also it takes like, it may take a few hunts to kind of figure out what the best tree is. So being able to move your setup quickly and easily is really, really important. So you don't want to go in there and throw a ladder stand up, have to spend an hour and a half hanging it and then have to move it and take it down. Um, also, these bucks in these smaller blocks of woods are extremely in tune with their environment. They're just so, they get so intimate with these small spots that they figure out where the access is into these blocks of woods. So being able to get in those trees that like you wouldn't normally be able to get into with a lock on is super important. Just getting in that spot where you're not going to get detected walking in and out every time. Um, also, we, neighborhood children are very in tune with the woods as well. That's and if true. If they find a big lock on stand or ladder stand or whatever you've got, like we've lost, <clears throat> especially early on, we lost a lot of permission from just our setups being discovered. So like as low key as possible is always the way to go. And and was that like they would get discovered by you know the the kids and like the kids would be climbing in the like, whoa 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 I don't want my kids climbing up there or like a neighbor's kids yeah uh, we oh. get permission on a block of woods and neighbor's kids goes you know strolling through the woods just exploring or whatever find some deer stand and now it's like now all the over. whole neighborhood knows yeah. and they're like we don't want people hunting in fired our neighborhood fired up the Karens kind of yeah bad deal <laughs> nobody likes that <laughs> no nobody no. likes that and actually I what I should have done I should have provided a little bit of background on the front end like you guys and you guys shed some light on that for sure but like I mean you guys are hunting like you said small block you know suburb type properties right and really like in my opinion like very like inconspicuous type stuff like the stuff that you guys are finding there like I wouldn't think would be there necessarily, mm -hmm. um, which is, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty neat in and of itself. How did you guys, now I'm sidetracking myself. How did you guys get into that a little bit? Like how, like what was the, uh, the catalyst for like, oh my gosh, like we should really start focusing on this. We stuff. got six and a half minutes to talk about that and other stuff. Just like super high level, high level, <laughs> high level, grew up in the suburbs, went to high school together. We're fishing a pond, but close to my neighborhood. And there was just insane deer sign. Ended up getting permission at a spot that was six acres, killed like five or six really nice deer out of there as we kind of figured out bow hunting. It was our first experience bow hunting. Lee started branching out all over Atlanta, kind of like duplicating that pattern that we figured out in this small block of woods and ended up finding some just insane bucks. Um, and then branching some, out from that, we've yeah. now expanded into other cities. Other, other cities, places. started filming. And it's just kind of snowballed since then. It's just like you're taking like that model, boom, apply it here, yeah. apply it here. And yeah. kind of what you just said, just finding those inconspicuous spots. Like there are obvious spots in suburbs. You have big, bigger blocks of woods, hardwoods and things like that. But what we kind of figured out is as, as hunting pressure increases, finding those overlooked spots is key. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times those are smaller fingers of woods that are coming off of those big blocks of woods. These, these blocks are very, very good at, identifying pressure they're really good at patterning people identifying pressure and then staying away from it like they will find some very very secluded places but and sometimes real tight places but they've just like nobody ever goes into them so they just never get bothered and finding those places is very difficult at times but pays off in big ways so yeah i mean like on the surface it's like well where would they have to go 
You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, you know, like, but. And, it, and don't get me wrong. They travel massive ranges. I mean, they range huge. Really? At certain times of the year. Oh, yeah. Which is probably part of your mobile strategy then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you guys might be on a deer, but, and then you've got these super small parcels. Yep. But you might have to hunt them here, I guess, yeah. and then try and figure out, well, maybe sometimes he's over here. Right. Yeah. We, we'll get, we'll get 20, 20 spots to hunt one deer. That's unbelievable. Not yeah. And that's just because we want to put ourselves in the right position at the right time. So that's, you know, we've got cameras on these places and being able to be mobile, it's like, let's go here, let's go there. So you're kind of like staying on them. But that's, that's what separates being consistent, every successful every year versus the guy that kills, gets lucky one time every 10 years or something and just happens to shoot one that comes through his property. Mm -hmm. Like you have to, you have to go after these deer. You can't just sit and wait on one spot. What what about uh, so and then I think you hit on a huge thing too with like the element of surprise like having kit like this that allows you to get into spots where they just haven't maybe been hunted out of there before because the trees suck or mm -hmm. they're short or they're brushy or they're this or they're that or whatever being able to you know jump up in something which honestly at the end of the day it might be an, an uncomfortable tree to get be in possibly but you're in it. Mm -hmm. I've, I've always said your first, your first sit is always your best sit. Yep. So being able to constantly change with these type setups is you're just putting yourselves in different positions at different times. You're getting fresh setups, kind of keeping that animal on his toes. Um, it makes it way more difficult for them to kind of figure you out. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing to me is like the way you're describing these deer, they're as wily and, and, key, and keyed in as like, you know, any buck that's out there. Which I'd almost assume, not assume, but you'd think or hypothesize like, well, they're so conditioned to being around people, but it's like they're just managing that pressure in a different way, but they still know, like, when you're in there, like, if you get, they just know what's up? I think, I think them being around people all the time almost makes them more in tune really? with what's going on because they have to be. They're, they're wild animals, they're deer, they're being hunted just as hard or harder than probably most of the country, at least in Atlanta. And they have to they have to be able to determine like what's a threat and what's not. So some kid playing in their backyard, they can determine that that's not a threat. But as soon as you kind of you cross into their bubble, into their zone, which maybe is far as me to you sometimes, like mm -hmm. you you walk off that that sod there out of their yard into the woods. Um especially if you're wearing camo or if they can't see you but they can smell you. They're on high alert, and most of these bigger bucks, like they're not going to just blow out of there. They're gonna, they're gonna set up in a spot where they can see where you're coming in and out. And if they see you, they're just gonna ease off, probably the back of a, a hill or something like that. And you'll and never, you'll never have see any them. Idea that you just don't know. What you've done. Yeah. Or they'll just sit up in their bed until you leave. So they're they're very very smart. They're very good at patterning you, and. He says there's some, Drew kind of made the comment, like there's some of the most pressured animals. They really are. I mean, if, if you have a 150-inch deer in certain places of Atlanta, there's 12, 15 guys hunting that same deer. And those bucks will still make it with all these people hunting them. So, like, they're not stupid. Contra no. Contrary to what people will think, like, oh, they're used to human scent, you know, human scent doesn't matter, blah, blah, that it, It's really, that is not true. Yeah. Uh, I, an example I'll give is, <clears throat> and I was just, it was on a doe hunt. I wasn't like, chasing some, you know, mega smart old deer or whatever. Uh-huh. Uh deer basically kind of got downwind to me, just some does. Got onto me, caught my scent, couldn't find me. When they can identify like people walking in parks or stuff, they smell somebody, they can identify it, no problems. Mm -hmm. Like they're used to that. People move on, deer goes about his business. When they're smelling human, they can't find you. That's when they're like, "All right, what's going? They you know something's not right. Something's not right." Deer smell me. She circled all the way back to a house and was like from me to Drew off the back porch where I'm sure those people had been countless times that day. Human scent all over the place. Mm -hmm. you, you know that deer is smelling that person, that, that pe those people that live in that house, yet the human scent she identified over here that she can't find and, and you know still can't find me, still smelling me, she blew at me and totally blew out of there standing you know three feet from someone's back deck where you would think they'd be used to human scent. Right. It's so almost... It's they know the difference. Yeah, it's like she's delineating. She's like, yeah, there's human scent here, and there's human scent here. The human scent over here, 
that's danger. I don't like that. Like, I see stuff. I smell stuff. I expect to, you know, nobody ever bothers me in this yard or whatever. At least that's what I'm picturing in my mind. It's just so interesting how they have to, like you said, they almost have to be extra keyed in. Like, a deer around here in general, like if you're hunting, you know, like a big piece of public or even like a big piece of private ground, like, I'd say in general, like if they smell a human, like it's probably bad news, right? But they have to like really sort, like an extra level of sorting that right. out. Huh. I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah. So they're more tolerant in ways to it, um, but they're also just like very keen to it and trying to identify the differences of like someone just a, a normal deal, someone walk through versus there's human scent here. I can't ad- identify what it is and on high alert, so... Mm-hmm. Well, and so looping back into you guys bouncing around a lot, I mean, like 20 properties to hunt one deer. Obviously, this is part of your system that we have on the table here. It looks like a tethered saddle system. Talk to us a little bit about that and how you guys are using that. And then you're oftentimes hunting with a camera person, yeah? Right. Yeah, yeah. pretty much all the time we're hunting with a cameraman. Um, kind of started using the saddles three years ago, I, I believe. Mm-hmm. And it's taken us a little bit of time to get used to, but I I prefer personally to hunt out of a saddle now more so than a lock on. Um, I would say that we use saddles probably 80% of the time now. Okay. Um, a big part of that is the mobility of it. It's just, it's easier to set up. It's less bulk in the tree, um, less to pack in, which most of the time we're not having to pack very, very far, but sometimes, sometimes we do. Um, to me, the biggest there's well the two biggest things about a saddle is a you can get in trees that you normally wouldn't be able to get into with a lock on stand. This platform is tiny, so like you can see you can get into like an eight inch diameter tree with this thing and it'd be stable. Um, and then like your tether, you can put around any size tree. Um, also, this is applicable ap- applicable during late season when there's like no cover in the woods. You can use that tree. You can keep the tree between you and the deer and use that as cover. Mm-hmm. So if I know the deer are coming out for, from behind you, I can set up on the back side of that tree to where I can kind of watch around the side of it, and I can wait for him to get into my shooting lane, wait for him to kind of turn broadside, and then I can lean out out of the tree either either direction. And even if like you plan on them coming this way and they come this way, you can still shift on the opposite side of the tree. Mm-hmm. So like you can kind of you know slowly shift, keeping that tree in between you and the deer, and it's especially late season like that's a game changer for sure. For sure, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, when it, are you both hunting out of saddles? Then, when you're together, yes, really, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah for a cameraman, it's great because, like, if you're on the backside of a tree and a lock on, you're having to turn around and film. But with a saddle, you're just you're right there. It's in your lap. You don't have to move very much. And if you want to, if you need to swing out to the side of the tree, you can easily do that without much movement. Awesome. Are you guys still using lock on sometimes? Specific trees, or are there some are there some spots that you have that you're like this is the spot. Like yeah. there's, there's no, like almost like the intrusion of having to hang that day. You like want to stay away from that. Yeah. If there's like a, so we used to have spots that would produce bucks, um, every year, every couple of years. Mm-hmm. It's not really like that anymore. Like we're constantly going out and having to find new, completely new areas. And that's just from the hunting pressure. Like there's just not that very, that, not that many mature bucks anymore in Atlanta. Um, but we still have like doe spots. We may have the perfect tree. Maybe it's too big for a saddle. Like it's too much to try to get around the side yep. of it. Mm-hmm. Or it's got great cover. Maybe it, it's got, you know, a bunch of different branches and you're really tucked in there. Um, then we'll just, we'll hang a lock on. Okay. But yeah, I'd say still probably 80% of the time we're using saddles. It's a tool. It's one of the tool, many tools that we have. And <clears throat> there's definitely certain situations where lock-ons are, are more favorable. And we still definitely do use lock-ons a lot, but we've especially the last couple of years have tended to favor the saddles for the reasons we just kind of explained. For sure. Yeah. I hunted out of one. I, I still do a mix. I'm probably like you guys like hang ons. I actually like, I love climbers. Like if, if you can get a climber into to certain trees, um, a lot of places that I've hunted, I can, uh, but like, it's just, yeah, I just hunt a mix, but man, the, the streamlined mobility, lightweight of, of a saddle, it can be, tough to beat you know you throw it in your backpack you can carry everything else that you want to keep within your backpack you know these steps are like crazy light yeah that, it's insane how light they are L- light enough to bring on the plane up here <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's sweet did we did we miss anything about your setup? What, what other gear do you guys carry with you 
like outside of like what you're hanging like uh like is it just like yeah we got our kit and uh and a knife if we need it and you're ready to go or like what other stuff are you guys carrying on on these more suburban type hunts um i mean obviously you got your range finder and your binos all the time even the times that you don't think you need binos are when you end up needing binos like you you need them so much more than you actually realize uh but other than that like in the tree we'll have probably two or three different hooks that we're just hanging stuff obviously a bow hanger Mm -hmm. tethered mix they're they're, uh, I think they call it the sis strap yeah. mm-hmm. where you can just hang a bunch of hooks. It's got like Molly webbing on it. You can just hang a bunch of stuff off of it. I bring that thing even when I'm not saddle hunting. Yeah. Like I, yeah. That's, that's handy. Um, a lot of times I'll just hang my backpack like down kind of near the platform and just stuff all my stuff in there. Like keep my quiver just in the backpack. Okay. Cause uh-huh. I don't like having a ton of stuff hanging off the, off the tree around my, like if I'm going to be shooting out mm-hmm. of the saddle, it can get in the way. Um, what else? I don't even know what else we bring. I, I we use, don't have to bring that much, honestly. No, yeah, it's super light, and that's why we like it. I mean, I I usually just use those little hooks that you screw into a tree. Oh, yeah. I'll have, if I'm, you know, got tree in front of me, I'll typically use the one, hang my bow flush to the tree. I'll typically hang one kind of low where Drew says, like, we'll put our quiver in our backpack, stuff like that. And then we'll have, we use these little fourth arrow camera arms that are sh- just super compact. Okay. And, um, you know, just kind of depending on where you're wanting to, your shot and stuff and where you want to film just have it kind of set up on either side mm-hmm. but yeah i mean it's super simple we're not really over complicating it mm-hmm. and um you know i mean there's there's more than one way to skin a cat people probably use all kind of stuff people probably prefer the longer bow hangers get you know the bow out here but i i, I kind of like having it flush on the tree yeah um, just kind of less yeah just less kinda, sticking out yeah. just kind of a little bit more hidden i guess for lack of a better term yeah I like it. Um, God darn it. I had one more question. And I'll t- sometimes have a, uh, like a drawstring um, that I'll tie into my saddle or something where it's just down to my bow where I can literally just make one trip all the way up. Um, I'll, I'll tie these, intertwine these together and loop one up, climb up, pull the next one. And I'm, so instead of going up to go back down for each step or grab my bow again, it's I'm literally – Arriving at this tree, making one trip up, and pulling the bow up, and you're you're good. It's just the most clean and efficient way to get up, um, especially if you're making several trips up and down. Like you're starting to sweat, you're putting more scent out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've just tried to be as efficient as possible and carry as little as possible. I'm picturing Taylor Chamberlain rappelling out of a out of his tree right now. <laughs> you asking I've about what, never what seen you, it happen. I was thinking about all the gear or we're kind of minimalist when it comes to like hunting urban stuff and I was thinking about how Taylor is the opposite of that and he probably has just so much stuff in the tree and then he repels out of the tree to be efficient and to be, look cool but uh I mean that's but, 50% of it at least yeah, right? yeah at least probably 75 and this is uh kind of on the optic side for the range finder <clears throat> the I guess what is it called like a lanyard lanyard where you kind of have it around your neck Oh yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. I'll actually tie a knot in it where it cuts off maybe like four inches of section of it, where it's just like instead of falling here and that movement, it's like sitting clo- like really close to my chest, and I'm it's just way more. Mm-hmm. It's just less movement, less kind of dangling around. That's just like a super small detail of something I do from the. Yeah, so you don't you don't wear side. a bino harness, do you, when you're white uh, hunting? Sometimes you do. Yeah, if I'm but, if I'm on the ground moving around, I'm yeah. I'm definitely wearing it. But most of the time when I'm tree hunting, I've got my binos in my book bag. Yeah, mm-hmm. see, I I try to just be as consistent as possible if I'm hunting off the ground or in a tree, just so I just keep everything in the same spot all the time. I have you know I put my range finder in one pouch here, binos up front. Uh, I shoot a thumb button release, so I keep it in like the zippered pocket on the front of the harness, and just having that consistent on every hunt helps me mentally yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I, I'm I'm like you and that I try to stay as regimented as possible and it's always like, you know, if you, you know, let's say you've been hunting deer and then it's like, okay, well now I'm going on elk hunt. And a lot of the gear is like identical and I actually try to keep things like, nope, this is my hunt kit. Like sometimes I carry extra things, some sometimes I whatever. Actually generally I just carry extra things. But um but it's always weird, man. It always takes a little bit when you're transitioning to something else to like it just like you know, you get your system, and then you just like you kind of throw a monkey wrench and things a little bit. It takes a little bit to get used to, but uh, you got a few steps here. How uh, how high are you guys hunting out there? I didn't bring all the steps that we usually use, okay. but uh, <laughs> I think we're usually running. So these are just obviously only have two steps on them. You uh, 
you have to use quite a few of them to get up there, but we usually get like 30 feet. We're getting really high 25 to 30, I mean, sometimes over 30 feet, and that can take six to seven steps sometimes. Um, and it's just, you can just get away with so much more the higher that you get. Just movement and scent? Movement or? and scent, yeah. Yeah. I just, and these I, deer are really good at picking you out of trees. You were saying that earlier. Yeah. yeah. They're very good at it. Like, and, they and are it, looking up. Like Oh, yeah. And it's weird, like, we hunted Kansas how many ever years ago? Yeah, that was, we were just talking about that before yeah, the podcast. Like, that was the only outfitted hunt I've ever been on. It was a buddy that, like, just kind of almost forced us to go because uh, he wanted us to go. And so, <clears throat> you know, this guy's like, you know, go out to this place, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I walk there, and it's like this ladder stand. It's like 10 feet off the ground. I'm like, this is not going to work. Right. And he's like, no, no, these deer don't look in trees. I'm like <laughs> – just blown away and sure enough deer came by did not care 10 feet off the ground a ladder stand but like we're used to being three times that high in a tree and they'll still pick they're us constantly off. just like you move an yeah. inch and they're like look they will, straight up at you yeah. you wonder if that's like just like either they're just because of pressure they've learned to do that or through like some natural selection I think process they're like only deer that look up live you know so what's kind of cool um i learned this recently i was um it was actually at the exact same spot I told you earlier where that doe circled around at the house and, mm-hmm. and blew at me three feet from their back porch. Uh, I was hunting a buck late season and more older deer, um, 140 inch deer, deer comes in and I didn't see him until it was too late. I'm sitting there, sitting there, didn't see him over to my right. I'm looking at deer over to my left. And I just made like literally the slightest movement like that. And this buck just boom locks onto me w- just uh, nope turned back around looped around sort of lingered around but like way away and I hunted that deer like solid the rest of the year never came in in daylight again and I was kind of your question like has he experienced that like what that slight movement what was it, why did that leave such a huge impact on him yeah and I actually just found out a few weeks ago from a new buddy that I've become friends with he was hunting that deer. He called him Mr. Perfect. And he said that he got busted by that deer in a tree. Um, he said he got busted by the deer. The deer kind of bounded off and, like, was looking at him as he was running out. And he said he shot and hit him and didn't kill him. It wasn't a lethal hit. But that impact on that deer, like, has obviously – that was two years ago or three seasons prior, actually, to when I was hunting him. But that has stuck with him his whole life that – he had that one just like, I saw that in a tree. I've associated that with what happened to me in the past. I'm not coming back. Yeah, like he was able to make the connection. Yep. Interesting. So and that, that's a rare moment where you actually understand, okay, something has happened in that deer's life that has told him this. Uh, I think that happens more often times than we actually even ever get to know about. Yeah, so. for sure. When you were hunting Kansas, where you're like, what is this strange world? It was bizarre. <laughs> I can it was do bizarre. whatever I want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. It's different. It's di- very different. Well, awesome, guys. Well, man, I appreciate you going through your kit, some of your strategy, how you guys are, uh, you know, finding success in uh, that unique suburban environment. Very, very cool stuff. If you guys have any questions or if you have thoughts or tips on this matter, comment below. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye.